Amazing how one complaint reinforces another complaint. It's amazing how you would think that they would have learned several occasions not to complain. In fact, the, the, uh, uh, what's going to happen here tonight is the plague's going to start. Another time that they were complaining that uh, snakes started coming out and biting them everywhere. And, but it was always the accusation they made against God that made them, made God more angry than anything. And that is that God lied to them, that God did not intend for them to be a nation. God did not intend for them to be what he claimed they were going to be. In fact, uh, uh, they, God just brought them out there to kill them. Uh, they uh, they had ascribed to God. They had cried to him during 430 years, and God finally looked down upon them, and he said to Moses, it's time for my, my people to be let go. You're going to go get them. You're going to bring them here. Moses made the excuses that we are familiar with, and then he finally gets the message that he's not, God's not going to take no for an answer. But every time that they would complain or every time they would whine, it would reinforce the next complaint. And that is, for example, they didn't have water and the water was bitter. Numbers chapter six. And when God told Moses, to take that tree and put it in the water, it made the water sweet, had nothing to do with the tree. It was God's ability to, to do that, to make the water sweet. And yet people got their belly full, as you will, got satisfied. Everything's going great. And then all of a sudden, here they go again. And they're complaining again about not having this and that. This is going to be a little bit different of a complaint. Uh, this is going to be, uh, there's going to be two complaints within one complaint. Uh, this is a a fellow by the name of Korah who approaches Moses and Aaron and he makes some accusations against Moses and Aaron. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we have tonight to study your word. Thank you, Father, for the ability to understand and we pray that we go away from here better than when we came. Father, we just pray for all of those who need our prayers this evening pray you continue to be with them. Thank you for answered prayers for so many other things that we've asked for. Thank you so much for your many wonderful blessings, but the greatest blessing being your son, Jesus. We just pray tonight you'll bless us as we read your word, study your word, and it's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. This is a totally different rebellion in that Korah, Dathan, and Abiram has about approximately 250 people with them and and i say approximately because uh, we don't know the total count of people that are going to die yes i gave you a sneak preview but they walk up to moses just like miriam and aaron did last week in our study and that is they are complaining that moses is just getting too too arrogant that he has been doing this job for so long that he does not want to share any of the leadership responsibilities that he doesn't want to. I mean, he, he's, he's just got this locked up and he's acting like a little child that uh, when, uh, when they want to, they want to have a new leader and Moses says, you don't want to do this. Uh, now I, I don't mind being examined, but you don't want to do this. Let's go to chapter 16, verse number one. Now, Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the, and on the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said, you take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? Now, remember his father-in-law, Jethro, told him one time when he was trying to be the leader and trying to do what he needed to do, 
Jethro says, you, you're taking too much responsibility upon yourself. What you need to do is you need to delegate those minor cases that are brought before you. And you let, you let the people, let some men of renown decide what needs to be done, but the big cases you keep. And that was good advice. Well, guess what? They, these men see this and they have made an accusation against Moses, something he never did. In our last study, in fact, we looked at who's the most humble man on the earth. And that was Moses. Well, continue with me, verse four. So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and he spoke to Korah and all his bunch saying, tomorrow morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near him. That one whom he chooses, he will cause to come near him. Do this, take censers, Korah and all your company, put fire in them and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it'll be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the holy one. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Well, here's the problem. They want to take more than what God has intended. Furthermore, when Moses makes the right call, what he does is, is he humbles himself. That's what God has asked us to do time and time again. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. The uh, problem for us sometimes, that's James chapter 4, verse 7, uh, the problem for us sometimes is, is that, okay, we do that, and and the Lord, uh, when's the Lord going to lift us up? A lot of times, we don't even notice him lifting us up. And so he says, the Lord's going to do the choosing. Well, that's the way it was to begin with. And I don't mean any disrespect by smiling about this, but it is totally amazing that to me that God chose Moses to begin with, a very angry man, a guy who you wouldn't have ever chosen. I wouldn't have chosen Moses because what did he say? Get somebody else to do it. You know what? If you don't want to do this, fine and dandy. I'll just, just let you go for the next 40 years or whatever it is, and you just go live in the land of Midian. But God wouldn't give up on him. Verse 8, then Moses said to Korah, here now, you sons of Levi, is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation to bring you near to himself to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to serve them and that he's brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi with you? And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? And he's going to say, what, who am I that you're going to complain against me? Inferred in the text too. But what he's getting at is, is the fact that they regarded what God gave them as nothing. I, this kind of spooked me when I read this again. Because I have borderline watched and, and observed and have kind of obeyed or kind of followed what I've, what I've seen some older members of the church do. And that is they have, you know, they, they've got the ability. They have the talent. They have, the, they have so many capabilities. But what do they do? They regard those talents, those abilities, as though they are not that important. That God is not that interested in what they have to say or what God's not interested in how they sound. I've heard members of the church say something like this. That, you know, if you heard me trying to sing, you wouldn't like hearing what I had to sing. Well, it's not up to me. I love the man sitting back where Jackie sat, maybe a seat or two back, not much. And he could not carry a tune in a bucket. He could not carry a tune in a bucket. <laughs> but he sang from the heart. And I didn't hear anybody complain about old John and the way he was singing. In fact, he told me one time, he says, I know I can't sing very well. He says, but 
And he said, I'm not here to sing for people. I'm here to sing for the Lord. And I was like, amen. And that's the way it should be. And that's the way it's designed to be. It's just like the burning of the flesh. I can just, you know, people tell me, you don't want to go back to the old law? No. I mean, when you burned the flesh and singed the hair and it was a sweet smelling aroma to God, it almost reminds me of when they did this highway the other day to try to keep the rocks and gravel uh, from messing with cars. And I got out and Christopher goes, that stuff stinks. I said, I think it smells good. And I really do. Uh, I think diesel smoke smells good too. I don't go sniff it. I liked regular gas. The, I don't go sniff it. I had a lady yelling at me one day. We went to go get gas. And when it was the days of regular, and I went to go get gas to put in the lawnmower. And I said, boy, doesn't that smell good? And she's like, what are you doing? Sniffing gas? No, I'm not sniffing gas. I'm not sniffing diesel. It's just that sweet smelling aroma to God is something we consider that stinks. But here's what he's saying. He's saying, look, you think that what God has appointed you to do is nothing. And I used to get, and I, I hate to use the term, but it was true. I used to get dumped on when it came to singing at home. And my dad and I were two of the song leaders but we had about three or four more and one of them inevitably would come right up before worship started and goes hey Dwayne can you lead singing for me this morning and I'd be like why didn't you ask me that about 10 minutes ago so I could pick some songs out and um, it's one of the reasons I memorized the old song book so well uh, because they do it every week and and yet they didn't consider what the Lord had given them a blessing. They thought it was something, it was a hassle. And Moses even goes so far as to say, and let me, let me try to explain what he's getting at here too. And that is all the sons of Levi were set aside to do the work of God. All priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. I'll let you think about that for a second. And Moses says, you honestly want to take God's appointment to be a priest? That's only for the tribe of Aaron. That's only for Aaron's lineage. I'm sorry, not the tribe of Aaron. Uh, Levi, that's only for him. Moses was not appointed the high priest. Moses was a priest. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, how else could he go into the house of God? So why are you complaining? They had it well. They had it good. Verse 12. So Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab. But they said, we will not come up. First of all, they've got a lot of people behind them. The old phrase comes to mind. Po what is popular is not always right. And that's what happens here. We will not come up. Moses sent to call them. Verse 13, is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? Now, I want you to think about this a minute. And I know I can't do this justice, but I'm going to try everything I can here. When you have two to two and a half million people leaving Egypt who do not know their left hand from their right hand, who have no idea how to defend themselves, who have no idea how to fight, who have no idea how to be an independent people. A lot of people don't understand when we have spent the last about 20 years in the Middle East. Well, I'll tell you what, we love democracy, don't we? We want that all over the world. And the question comes up time and time again, why in the world do those people not want democracy? Because they don't understand it. 
They sincerely do not understand how you can be free without having to answer to a government, without having to answer to this, after to that. It just, it's just totally mind-boggling to them. And so what does he do? What do they do? They accuse Moses, first of all, of the same argument. Now, I, I, I don't have a dumb question because you're dumb. I have a dumb question because I know the answer to it. How many have ever complained about politics? Anybody ever done that? <laughs> uh, the kids, I'll catch them from time to time, but they'll be complaining about our current president and, and, and they don't know what all they're saying. They just hear it at home. But it's, and I've said it to, at m and with friends of mine for, I don't know, I don't know how long. One time for three hours, we argued about politics. Do you think we solved any of it? No, it was just fun to argue about it. It was just fun to gripe about it. It was fun to complain about it. But it reinforces what we've already heard. And that's what, what Moses wants us to get, get at as well. The Holy Spirit's wanting us to understand Look, it is, a, is it a small thing that you brought us out of a land flowing with milk and honey? Now, wait a minute. Hold on. Let's go back here a minute. What was the promise God made in Numbers 13, going back to Deuteronomy 3 or 2? I'm going to take you to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. You're going to bring back some of the produce. I don't remember Egypt being a land flowing with milk and honey. Do you? I just don't. I remember they wanted out of there. Verse 13, is it a small thing that you brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you've not brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, nor give us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Now, hang on just a second. Why didn't they get this land? Why didn't they get everything God promised them? Go back to Numbers 13 and 14. It is indeed a land flowing with milk and honey. It's everything God said, except we can't take it. God said we can, but we can't. Oh, no, we can't take this. And the reason is they are so big. And we are so small. In fact, they saw us. I don't remember them seeing them. That's what a spy does, right? You don't see, you don't see, right? Then you get to, to the latter part of Numbers 13 and the 10 spies came back into 14 and they told a lie. And the people believed the lie. And when the people believed the lie and they wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb along with Moses and Aaron, God said, get out of my way. I've had it. I'm done. They are going to be wiped off the face of the map. But Moses interceded for them, just like he's doing now. They've got this whole story so turned around, they can't even make heads or tails of it. Verse 15, Moses was very angry. And he said to the Lord, do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, tomorrow, you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they, as well as Aaron, let each take his censer and put incense in it. And, e and each of you bring a censer before the Lord, 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with a censer. So every man took a censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gave all, gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them 
in a moment. And they fell on their faces and they said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? So the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the congregation, saying, get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and all the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. Now, here's what's pretty exciting. They did what Moses said to do. They didn't sit there and mince words. They didn't sit there and go, you know, I, maybe I think Dathan and Abiram has got a point. Maybe Korah and his bunch have a point. Moses says, get away from them. And they did exactly what he said. Verse 28. <clears throat> By this you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. For I've not done them of my own will. I want to stop here just for a second. And I know the story continues. But somebody else said that same statement or pretty close. You remember when Pharisees and scribes kept pressuring Jesus? Actually, they just kept asking him. It wasn't a pressure to him. But they just kept pressing him and pressing him about by what authority do you do the things that you do? And it finally came to a head in John 18. He says, I'll tell you what. I will answer your question if you'll answer mine. Well, what's that? Not John 18. I'm sorry. Um, I'll have to look that up. I apologize. But it's still biblical. The baptism of John. Was it from men? Or from heaven. And they stood there and they thought amongst themselves and they said, you know what? If we say that came from heaven, he's going to say, well, why didn't you believe it? And then if we say, well, that didn't come from heaven, people are going to stone us to death because they all considered John a prophet. And so they copped out and they said, we don't know. And he says, neither will I tell you about what authority I do, the things that I do. Jesus is a prophet and a priest after the foreshadowing of Moses. In fact, he, Moses said this in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 through 17. I'm, God's going to raise up a prophet just like me. And when he raises that prophet up, He's going to be a prophet and priest. And we know from Revelation chapter one, he's prophet, priest, and king. He makes the rules. We don't. Verse 28. <clears throat> and Moses said, by this, you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally, like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. And it came to pass as he finished speaking all of these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah with all their goods. So they and all those who were with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away. The censers of these men who sinned against all their souls, let them be made into, a ham into hammered plates as a covering for the altar. Because they presented them before the Lord, therefore they are holy. 
and they will be assigned to the children of Israel. So Eleazar, the priest, took the bronze censers, which those who were, who had, who were burned up had presented. They were hammered out as a covering on the altar to be a memorial to the children of Israel that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he might not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord had said to Moses. The other day, David Sproul from Palm Beach Lake said something pretty powerful. Well, I'm kind of understanding a little bit more why they asked what they asked. And that is when they would, when they want to know something, for example, Gideon, when he wanted to really have proof that he's going to lead the children of Israel out of the Midianites' hands, give me a sign. They asked Jesus, give us a sign. Jesus said, no sign's going to be given except the Son of Man be lifted up. And that's the only sign we still have. <clears throat> and here is, here is Moses. And he's telling these people that this is going to be a sign. This is going to be something you need to understand. That when you see those hammered plates... This is one time God opened up the earth. I don't know what that was like. I have glimpses, maybe. But that's the first time and the only time I remember God ever using the earth to swallow up those who rebelled against him. And that's the thing that, that uh, they never did learn very well. Oh, I know who they thought they were rebelling against. They thought they were rebelling against Moses. They thought they were rebelling against Aaron. But what does the Holy Spirit want us to remember? And no, who are they actually rebelling against? It's God. And shoot, man, I'm glad to tell you. Let me tell you tonight, I am so tickled to death to report. I can't even hardly finish this. I'm, hard, I'm so glad to report to you tonight. That's the last time they complained. I said it was hard for me to finish because that's not true. They not only got, got scared to death of what they saw, but watch what happens on the next day. Verse 41, and on the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Now, hold on a minute. <laughs> hold the phone. Just like that old television, that old movie. Hold it, hold it. Who's the judge? Was it Moses? No. Was it Aaron? No. You know who the judge was and who the judge still is today. And that's God Almighty. And these people were told, get away from these 200, or these, uh, a core in his bunch, get away from the 250 men. And they still are saying, after the earth swallowed them up, they're still saying they're godly and holy. Almost reminds me of the time that lady, we were talking about Oral Roberts and how he got caught in some of his shenanigans in the late 80s. And the lady said, but he's still a man of God. I, I almost lost my cool on that. Because he wasn't, and he's not. Well, how do I know? Well... <laughs> How do I know that this is not right? Well, look at what happens. Verse 41, on the next day, all the congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, saying, you killed the people of the Lord. And it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting, and again the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. Now, did they see the glory of the Lord before? Yes. Did they see it back in Numbers or Exodus chapter 19? Yes. Then Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of meeting, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Get away from them. Get away from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a censer 
<clears throat> put fire in it from the altar, put incense on it, and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them, for wrath has gone out from the Lord. The plague has begun. And Moses Aaron took it as commanded, ran into the midst of the assembly, and already the plague had, be had begun among the people. So he put the incense and made atonement for the people, and he stood between the dead and the living. So the plague was stopped. And this wasn't a very big plague. Uh, this wasn't very many people at all. <clears throat> If you believe that, I've got some oceanfront property in Oklahoma I'll give you. Verse 48, he stood between the dead and the living, so the plague was stopped, and the, those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who had died in the Korah incident. And so Aaron returned to Moses at the door of the tabernacle of meeting for the plague had stopped. Now, another time, we're going to come back to another plague that's in the form of snakes. I, I love to show Brienne a picture of snakes. She saw one at her back at her front door one time when she's getting ready to come to church and like to scream bloody murder. We heard her all the way over here. Not really, but... But um, by the time when God starts sending out snakes and they start biting people, that day, 23,000. And the only way that they were spared was he took a bronze serpent, held it up, and everybody that looked at it was saved. That bronze serpent is a foreshadow of Jesus. Now, wait just a minute. What do you mean by that? The lifting up the lifting up between the land and the sky. And you see, he took the curse. He took our place. And that's why it is so important to be a child of God. It is so beneficial to be a child of God. If we could just get people to see that point, I will tell you, I think we could fill up buildings. I think we could fill up all kinds of things. But most people don't look at it that way. Most people think church is oppressive. It's greedy. Well, I know some denominations that are, but the Lord's church isn't. The Lord doesn't need our money because it's not our money. I, tell, I told a friend of that one time. I said, it's not our money. It's not your money. He said, yes, it is. Said, no, it's not. It's the Lord's. He gave it to you. He let you use it. He let you be a steward of it. I'm hoping that he'll eventually come around, but I'm still working on it. But anyhow, these people accuse God of something that they could not tell the truth on. They could not make it stand. They could not validate it. And twice God said, get out of my way, just in our study tonight. Twice God said, get out of my way. I'm going to consume them in a moment. Moses and Aaron intercede. But eventually, God will not listen to Moses' intercession. And we're going to talk about that, <clears throat> Lord willing, next time in Numbers 20. Thank you for being here tonight. Let's pray. Again, Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you so much, Father, for your word. Thank you so much, Father, for the abilities we have, the technologies we have. And Father, we just pray that you will forgive us of our sins, that you'll help us to be clean and right in your sight. Please be with each one of us as we go home tonight. Keep us safe and in your care. And again, forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much.